Well, good morning. So, the vendor parties, the invited talks, the plenaries, the technical program, the show floor, they're all just warm up back for this last session. So, thanks for hanging in here and coming out for uh, what is literally the last event uh, of the program. Um, we're going to talk, as the title says, about energy efficiency and large scale HPC. Uh, we've got a great group uh, of folks uh, to give some practical experiences. Uh, spanning Europe, Asia, uh, and the U.S. Uh, and I thought I would frame a little bit, and I want to pose some questions for you to think about, um, and our speakers will address those, but I want you to think some about the questions uh, while they are talking. So if you sort of think about what was true, if you posed the question at this conference 10 or 15 years about energy use in HPC, you'd probably have gotten mostly blank stares back, uh, because it just wasn't that big a deal. Uh, and it has become a big deal because of the rising scale of our systems. Uh, and it has put real economic as well as engineering constraints on design and deployment. And so what we normally see in the pretty pictures of our deployed HPC systems, of course, you know, are the, the actual computing hardware, but that's really the iceberg view of what there is. There are all these other pieces of cooling systems, energy distribution, maybe backup generators, depending on how important it is, backup battery systems, a whole lot of control infrastructure. And the system itself is really uh, the iceberg that's above, the piece that's above water. And if you think about how we optimize, Jim Gray years ago said that there were four axes that really determine the capability of a system. Uh, it's networking performance, uh, latency and bandwidth, obviously computation performance, storage scale, capacity and performance, and the associated access times. And that any time the ratios of those things changed, you had a new optimization point, and that, that was what led a lot of design change. And so in this space of HPC energy optimization, there have, of course, been big changes in facilities. Um, PUE is now a, an acronym that most of us know. <laughs> Um, in systems design and, of course, operations as well. And part of what we're going to talk about is all of those things, but in particular, issues around software with respect to optimizing energy efficiency. And just to sort of put this in broader perspective, about 10 years ago, when I first went to Microsoft uh, and worked on cloud data center design, one of my colleagues, Christian Bellotti, did one of those experiments that wasn't particularly engineering sound, but got mindshare very quickly. He took a few HP servers and he put them out in a tent in Seattle. And obviously it rains a lot in Seattle. They ran them for a year and nothing happened. They just kept running, other than a few leaves got blown into the fan intake areas. And that led, you know, it really drove home the social point that our historical design of the infrastructure was overly conservative. Most of us who are older remember a time that if you spent much time in the computer room, you needed a winter coat because it was cool sort of for polar bear habitation. That drove, along with the rising costs and scale, a lot of rethinking about what the envelope really needed to be for operating temperature and for humidity. And a lot of the issues about airside economization and other things came out of that, led ASHRAE to dramatically relax its recommendations for the psychometric uh, charts that defied humidity and temperature operating envelopes uh, and led a lot of change in hardware design based on that realization that we had been overly conservative. So here's some questions to think about that the panel was asked to think about. Which part of system software has been most helpful uh, in improving energy efficiency? Which software stack layers should, in fact, support this, uh, spanning everything from systems up through applications? What might encourage adoption of some of the developing APIs for energy efficiency? Uh, what are some of the biggest opportunities for further improvement? Uh, and then a few more radical, uh, provocative questions that came from some of the panel members themselves. As PUE approaches one, and remember PUE is the ratio of total energy that goes into the facility to fraction of energy that actually drives the computing hardware. As it approaches one, at what point do you reach across the point of diminishing returns? Um, and one of the age-old conundra about control system theory 
you know, can software-based systems adapt rapidly enough or do they need dedicated hardware? Uh, another sort of framing cost-benefit question is what's in it for the users to focus on developing energy efficiency codes and that trade-off about trying to advance science uh, versus the effort involved in energy management and the cost-benefit ratios uh, from their perspective and what incentives might be necessary there. And another way maybe to frame that in terms of TCO benefits of deploying an HPC system, what's the trade-off in tuning codes about investing time and performance? first investing in reduced energy consumption, if you sort of think about that energy performance product and what the area is uh, under that curve with respect to running time. And then maybe more generally, what are the fundamental properties of energy efficient applications? You know, are there some design principles there? Uh, and so with that framing, so think about those questions. We're going to have four presentations. I uh, invite you to then ask questions, uh, these or others, and the panel members will talk about some of these questions and some other things. Uh, and we'll start with Sadaf. Good morning. Thank you for coming for this, the last and the last session <laughs> of supercomputing. And, um, and it's good it's about energy because I'm certainly very low on energy <laughs> right now. And for those of you who came here to hear Thomas Schultes, I'm sorry that you can clearly see I'm not him. <laughs> so I will start by saying who we are. Uh, so Swiss National Supercomputing Center uh, provides high-performance computing <laughs> storage and data analysis and networking resources to researchers all over Switzerland and beyond. Our flagship system is Spistein. Uh, it's a hybrid and heterogeneous system. Um, it has over 5,300 uh, uh, Pascal-based uh, nodes and about 1,600 dual-socket broadwells. And uh, all of it is in, within the same network fabric. So what you see uh, on, for example, uh, top 500 and green 500 are just the part of the system. It's not the entire system. It's the hybrid part of the system. We submit two parts uh, separately for these, uh, to make these submissions. Uh, in this time, we consolidate a number of services, including, of course, high-performance computing, data analysis, visualization, and more. And as there are some uh, of the examples of what, uh, what has been the scientific outcome of uh, 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 from researchers over PISDINE. So I, I'm not expecting you to read all of this, but there are links if you go to CSCS website uh, to our, for example, our annual report and uh, the actual configuration of PISDINE so you can find more about it. <clears throat> so one of the questions was around uh, tools. So I approach uh, the panel from an operation perspective uh, because up until recently, my job was to build system and, and run them in operations. So on Quizdine, we have a set of tools and they serve different purposes. So on your top, uh, uh, the, the equipments you see there, we use them for level three measurement for official submissions such as top 500 and lean 500. So any submissions that show and appear on uh, for this time, uh, going back uh, many years, we make sure that if we make a submission, we should make it as higher accuracy uh, and as complete as possible. Because you, you, if you want to take these things seriously, I'm not saying that the top 500 is the only way to measure <laughs> these value. But if the com if the community has made an effort to come up with guidelines. Uh, uh, about how to do it is, is our duty. When we make these measurements, we do them as complete as possible. During the operations, what we have is uh, we read up data over the whole entire system, and we also read data on a per row basis because we have one entire row of 10 cabinets with uh, multi-core nodes and then three with uh, hybrid nodes. So here what you see is uh, over the period of about five, six weeks, the usage in kilowatt per row. 
So this is a view for sysadmins. This is an internal view people can, uh, people operating the system have. And we draw many conclusions and analysis about system usage, utilization, in some cases bad components or unusual behavior from that. So it's all, the data is stored historically and it's based on a gray log backend, elastic search backend. And we, we can do a lot of searches from there. Um, our system is a Cray XC50, XC40 system. So Cray provide uh, a, a, a set of, in, in fact, it's a database called Cray Performance uh, or Power <coughs> Measurement Database. So in this database, there you can get more than a node level results, but you can also have measurements on a blade where the network and uh, router chip is. You can have measurements on a cabinet level, and you, you have scripts to correlate jobs. But this database is, uh, typically use in privilege mode. And the reason we have not exposed it yet to our users is because uh, the part of system it sits on, if we expose it to, to, our, uh, to our users, it, it, it could really overload it. So right now we are trying to export it out of one, what we call it on, on, from a management node to a beefy uh, server. So this data can be exposed in a safe and secure manner uh, to users. But users on the system can get some information about the, no, the, the usage of, uh, in, uh, in, in this case, they get jewels about their job, which doesn't include uh, all the other components. It only includes the node level, what happens within a node during, the, uh, during, a, during a job run. And they can always get by uh, using the Slurm accounting command on the system. So, all these things. There, there is an a, a, API also that Cray provides, but currently, uh, which you can use to instrument your application, but currently it's not completely functioning right now for various reasons. So <clears throat> I'm now going to take an application perspective and try to motivate this discussion, because uh, I have, for this panel, I had this discussion with Thomas, and he said this is kind of because it's about also software and application and motivation for users. So Matthew Swiss is the Swiss uh, uh, weather uh, forecasting uh, service. And, and here what you see is that what they wanted to do back in 2013. So I show a map of Switzerland, meaning that it's teeny tiny, but compared to <laughs> maybe, but it has uh, many, different regions, and, and there are many small airports in valleys where if you don't do uh, uh, high precision simulation, you can miss out some predictions. So one of their first goal was to increase the resolution by going from 2.2 kilometer grid to 1.1 kilometer grid, which would add from a computation point of view a factor of 10 in terms of requirements. Then they wanted to have the higher prediction accuracy with multiple, so multiple ensemble run, which would add about 24 times in terms of what needed to uh, be gained, and then another six for uh, subsequent data simulation and other processes. So altogether, they wanted to have a factor of 40 uh, between the, their production uh, forecasting uh, 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 capabilities between going from 2012 to 2005, they changed their system in a three to four year cadence. And uh, surprisingly, <laughs> not surprisingly, as they say, uh, uh, without any increase into the uh, investment and operations budget. So, uh, so a group of t people, uh, they started back in 2010 through multiple programs refactoring the code uh, because we said that simply the moral law will not deliver that thing. And because the budgets were fixed, we cannot just add uh, that many uh, compute nodes. So, the, 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 uh, so it was a um, multiple year effort and it's already ongoing because it's a, essentially a DevOps effort where the, the Fortran and MPI code was taken, which was uh, uh, vectorized typically on vector machines, and it was redesigned to use some uh, uh, more modular approaches and what uh, is typically some people define as domain-specific language approaches so that uh, the backend can run on a multi-core, on a GPU, and other devices. And the thing turned out to be quite successful. So we have had since almost 
uh, two years ago, we deployed the first uh, operational weather forecasting system based on GPUs. Uh, I think uh, people in NVIDIA were probably a little bit more excited than we were. And we call it PISCash because most systems that, <laughs> in fact, PISDIND are based after Swiss mountains. And uh, what you see here are two systems. So each system is, an stand, is a self-contained system with uh, compute nodes, storage, all the management framework, post-processing, and all those. And the second system is a failover system. And it has uh, a large number of uh, GPUs. <coughs> and majority of op uh, oper uh, compute power is coming from GPUs. <coughs> so we then did analyze where the factor 40 improvement came from. So as you can see, a large part, both for CPU also and GPU, came from uh, code refactoring. Uh, and, uh, and then another part in terms of uh, mathematical improvement, because it was a collaborative effort with Matteo Swiss there, and they used, in some cases, mixed precision methods also. Um, well over two came from the architectural change, mainly for the due to the memory bandwidth gains of the GPU over CPU. <laughs> Some more law improvement, architectural and design improvement, the way that the nodes were designed, and there were additional workflow processes that resulted. So altogether, the target was reached uh, uh, from an investment point of view at about the same budget. But the interesting part for us was our operational cost compared to their previous machine was lower, mainly due to the GPUs. And the saving was so high that uh, we were able to add some um, staff to the team which can maintain uh, the code in this DevOps mode in the system. So the lessons for us are, are part of the answering the question for the panel is, so if, I, if you look at your site, so there are these uh, snapshots from the top 500 and green 500 pages. So what you see here is uh, Pistine is a listing, but the part that I highlight here is uh, power. So you see two power uh, uh, ratings there. One is what we call normal one, and one is what we call optimized. And I'll explain in a bit what it means. And you can see which level it's there. So in the green leaves, I try to, so these are my message because it's a, 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 about energy efficiency. So right now, uh, PIS9 is the only system that has, uh, that submits a level three sub, uh, submission for power measurement or power usage for making this HPL run. And it may be, I mean, it's, it's a thought process that if, if the community has invested so much in defining these level, and if we take these top 500 <laughs> measurements and green 500 measurements seriously, it would not incentivize uh, other sites and center if the top systems uh, can uh, agree on, uh, or I, I'm not endorsing it, but can agree on providing that level of measurement. Because now if we talk about the holistic level of measurement, including workflow and the entirety of the facility, uh, we, 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 it, it would give a good message that we are serious about it and not just care about the best run and on the, the compute part or a sub, subsequent of compute part, part of the system. Because level one submission, uh, I am I, not in it. So I started reading the description of level one submission and that was pretty light. Uh, now I say why we have two, sub, uh, two parts in the kilowatt, in the power measurements. So when we run the green 500 submission on PISDIND, we use only a subset of CPU cores and even lower the frequency uh, there. And the run is, from a performance point of view, a little bit um, uh, slower. And uh, so I don't know how it works out in, for the other systems, but you could imagine, depending on what you target, you can, uh, uh, depending on the goal and target, you can or can uh, you can choose or not to choose, you choose to utilize part of the uh, part of the resources that you have to optimize it for far power. I'm not suggesting that's what we should be done, but that's how it is being done here. So the other part where it's uh, uh, is taken from the green 500 list, uh, and again. Uh, 
uh, as been the case for many years, uh, is largely dominated by system with accelerators or some specialized components. So I use this cartoonish image here. When we try to optimize or make a goal or a target which is maybe different from performance or this more law-driven performance, we may have to make some investment in codes. And, uh, and, uh, and this has been done. That's why we have many systems. In fact, I was just reading through the, the news releases for the student cluster competition, and it was also quite interesting seeing very few CPU cores, but mainly accelerator devices. But uh, in, in, in most cases, I hear people not particularly uh, interested in code rewriting and refactoring, because if, if you agree that in order to be serious about uh, energy efficiency, you have to build systems with components and tools and designs that are energy efficient and which may have some, uh, some requirements on the applications you run or workflow you run on the system. And my final message is, and it, it was echoed among other panelists, how we engage users and developers in this process. So the obvious thing is, of course, policies and procedures. I can say at CSCS, only time our users want to measure power of their jobs or application is when they are doing some kind of a submission for a paper or something. <laughs> Otherwise, although the data is available to them through Slurm, no one really asks us uh, for anything. So um, if, if we have some kind of an incentive or a reason that in addition to their, their allocation in terms of node hours, uh, and correlated, uh, that I think that would incentivize. But I think it cannot be a one-way street because without tools, um, it will be a. So for me, the tools include both parts. The tool includes parts which which helps users or developers taking and moving code from not so energy efficient hardware and system to energy efficient hardware and system. But at the same time, if we are making some policy changes then they can engage in this iterative process where they can uh, uh, use the system uh, in, in an efficient way as we would like them to use it from an uh, energy efficiency point of view. So this is all I have. Thank you. be lazy and just sit at the uh, <laughs> table here. <laughs> so we, um, as Dan showed, we got a, a wonderful series of questions. I'm going to provide you answers to a selected subset of them and then in with a, a few things about what I think we need to do to uh, help get energy efficiency through the use of software. So the first question we got was, you know, what was the biggest contribution to HPC system energy efficiency? I'm, shortening the, the question, which had a lot more uh, substance in it. Um, and it was really aiming at the software. But in our case, the biggest contribution um, was cooling. Uh, we were an early adopter, or, or maybe a re-adopter, of um, uh, water cooling in the systems. So our building, which was completed about 10 years ago, uh, was built intending to use water to remove heat from the systems. Um, our original system would have been you know, fully, what we call fully water-cooled. The uh, system that we ended up installing in the end is uh, sort of water-assisted air-cooled. It's air-cooled through the cabinet, but the heat doesn't leave the cabinet as air. It is exchanged with water uh, and then goes through several sequences of heat exchangers, eventually ends up on a heat exchanger on our roof, and uh, except on days that are really hot, uh, that's where we get our cooling. So we don't use the campus chilled water supply except during hot summer days. And we expect to not use the campus chilled water at all for the next generation of system. Uh, it's, this has been great for the users because they have no idea that it is going on. They don't have to make any changes whatsoever. Uh, and it does uh, bring us to the point where our PUE is um, very good. Uh, PUE for this, the uh, data centers between 1.1 and 1.2. It's that high only because we have another number of other fairly uh, substantial systems 
which use older cooling technology. So the, uh, our biggest system uh, brings us to a, a more efficient level. So at that level, there isn't a lot to be done uh, to improve the efficiency. Um, and it's just a, a, a few descriptions of the center and the sort of infrastructure that you need to support um, large scale uh, water cooling. This building can uh, today uh, handle about 24 megawatts. It actually has 32 megawatts. There's uh, eight megawatts of uh, hot spare uh, from uh, three different providers. Um, or there's, there's 32 megawatts total with eight megawatts of spare. Uh, oh, this is very sensitive clicker. Very careful with this one. Okay. How does your center uh, contribute most to energy efficiency? Uh, so here's now where we get more to the software and uh, the focus of what I'm going to be saying, and I think you'll hear this message from um, others, and in fact you just heard it, is a, a lot of the efficiency, in some sense the same as getting it from using more efficient cooling, um, is that if the code is more efficient, then it takes less power. And so we have... Uh, have yeah, another cooling message. Yeah, so so finding ways to induce the users to make their codes more efficient uh, is a good way to make them more energy efficient. Uh, when we look at the incentive question, um, this one is somewhat sobering because of the way that. Uh, computer time is allocated, at least in the United States, there isn't even a huge incentive for most application developers to make their code faster, because if they need more time, they ask for more time. They have no idea how much it costs, it's free. Um, of course, it's not free, but that's how they look at it. There's, there's no incentive there, to, or, and there's no mechanism to trade it off. They can't say, if I ask for less time, but will you give me uh, 100K for a programmer to help tune the code. It's just not an option. And so we, we have a very perverse set of incentives. Uh, so um, we have been able, through various mechanisms, um, basically providing the funding that is necessary to improve the efficiency of the codes uh, to bring them to that um, more efficient level. Um, it's also um, important to note um, that uh, as part of this, it's important to understand what's the achievable performance of the application, and this is different than measure, getting measurements of instruction counts and then trying to tune those, because uh, in particular, memory references can be misleading there. Uh, even in dealing, in trying to explain this to my students, they have a tendency to um, look at, well, I do all these loads and stores, and I look at the code and I say, but you shouldn't, in fact, be doing all of those loads and stores. You only need to do some of them. Um, and that's uh, because that's both a huge contribution to the performance gaps, but it's also where a lot of the energy is spent. Um, understanding how much data you absolutely have to move as opposed to how much the expressions of the algorithms are moving um, is important. Uh, another thing that, that's important is understanding how you uh, can get more efficiency for the user in ways that doesn't impact them. So on our system, laying out the jobs appropriately uh, for the interconnect network can make a significant difference in the elapsed runtime of the applications. If it's poorly laid out, uh, there's more interference, codes run more slowly. Uh, with the next generation of networks, um, I have a message for you, this is going to still be somewhat true, but it's going to be harder to work out. Um, where should energy awareness be added to the software stack? Well, it's easiest, again, if the user has no idea where it is. Um, but I think one needs to step back from this question and uh, ask it in terms of what is it you're trying to know. So if you're trying to do information gathering, uh, there are places that you can put this where it's fairly uh, benign in terms of its impact on the users. And so a few years ago, we did this with I.O., and we were able to gather a lot of uh, extraordinarily depressing data on the efficiency of I.O. in applications. In fact, there's a number of places where we were able to get significant performance improvement simply by uh, identifying places where I.O. was being done exceptionally poorly and fix those. Um, 
But even there, again, as a, as a cautionary tale, about half of the users opted out, not for any good reason in most cases. It was mostly, this might impact either the correctness or the performance of my code. And since it might, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, fortunately, about half the users were either willing to tolerate it or because it was, in fact, completely transparent, forgot that it was happening and let it go on. Uh, but that is a real challenge in trying to collect data uh, on the basis of which we can start making uh, decisions about how to move forward from that. Um, so finding ways to put such data collection into the runtime in a way that you can convince at least a majority of your users that it will do no harm is really important. Um, and if you can't guarantee that, uh, users will opt out, and if you don't provide them with a way to opt out, they will opt out. Um, okay. um, and then, will users uh, make codes energy efficient? No. I could just go. Satoshi will give a, give a different answer, but... Oh, no, um, no, no. I agree with you. Oh, you agree with you. Yes. Okay. Um, there needs to be an incentive. Well, no, yeah. So, if there's an incentive, then absolutely they will. But right now, there's an there's a inverse incentive. If you do anything that slows the code down, you're taking away their ability to do science. Um, uh, there is a caveat on that. There are um, some users who uh, may be willing to um, experiment or to be good global citizens, just as there are people who are willing to buy clean energy for their house, even though it costs more. Um, but that uh, is likely to be um, a small community. Uh, further, um, it's not trivial for many of our centers to uh, make a unilateral decision to be good global citizens because we have to get policies approved uh, if we make uh, significant changes to how we manage the allocations which have been approved by the people who funded the system. Um, and so that needs to be taken into account. Um, we could change the charge allocation to include an energy um, consumption weight um, and that would provide an incentive, uh, but then you run into other issues, including um, not knowing exactly how much time you can give away because now it's going to depend on how efficient the codes are. It's actually not maybe that bad because we found that we can provide other sorts of incentives because uh, the users are never perfect in terms of using up all of their time, um, but one would have to be quite careful about this. Does the community need to collect and share data? So I would say yes, and the goal here would be to figure out how to provide those incentives. Uh, so we need to measure the energy use um, and really find ways to provide actionable feedback to the users. Um, and for that, we need to collect data on different approaches um, and, and really explain them to the users um, in their context. Even though, um, as I'm looking at that data, I'm looking at the um, number of dollars that I'm paying for power, um, I don't really have control of that. I have to convince the users that it's in their interest um, to help me out. <clears throat> and there are a lot of complexities to this. In particular, even if we collect the data perfectly, um, there it's going to be um, real challenges assigning it to applications. And I think the short form of that is we'll never be able to do it perfectly, just as we can't, in fact, assign uh, the used time perfectly to uh, applications because of interference between them. But we'll have to do it anyway, just as we do with time. Um, but we'll have to be careful in describing this to users because they're engineers and they will point out the flaws in our measurements. <laughs> okay. Oops. okay, so four steps for energy efficiency. Uh, I think the first one is, in some sense, the easy one is also a hard one, um, is performance efficiency. So the, uh, the more you can get out of the applications, um, the more effective you've made use of the, uh, the energy. And that re really requires understanding what performance you could get before you go off and tuning it. Otherwise, you might be tuning the wrong things. Um, and that's also sort of an assumption of I'm taking the code and I'm making it faster. Uh, a lot of these codes were designed, uh, and some of them are still designed, under the um, assumption that computing, you know, the execution model for computing is uh, a really fast single scalar processor and then there's stuff that's hacked onto it to deal with some realities. Uh, in many cases, I think it's going to become increasingly important to step back, rethink 
the algorithm, possibly even the mathematical models, to make them more appropriate for the sort of hardware we have today. In fact, the hardware we've had for several decades, uh, and in particular, the hardware that we're going to have going forward. Um, and so that, of course, is terrifying to anybody who has a piece of code, but I think that that's going to be an increasingly important part of achieving real energy efficiency. Um, and there's sort of an interesting gotcha in here. Um, having a, a bulk synchronous style program has a lot of uh, benefits for trying to do energy management because you're running between cycles where you can turn off either the communication or the compute. But if you go to a exascale programming uh, panel, they'll be telling you that you can't possibly program those machines uh, in a bulk synchronous style uh, because you need them to be much more dynamic. Um, so maybe these guys should be talking to each other. Um, you also get what you measure. So um, uh, the only way to really make progress, I think, with the applications is to provide them information on how well they're doing and perhaps how, well, how much they're costing. So one of the things that uh, we've started to do, I think uh, NSF has been doing this with exceed allocations for a while. We've been doing this uh, more recently with allocations on blue waters is that when we give somebody an allocation of time, we tell them what the dollar value of that is. And I've had the experience, I've had people come up to me and say, I had no idea that that time was worth that much. Um, and as you start exposing that cost, you can start encouraging people to take that into account. It may only be in getting them to say, gee, that's an awful lot of money. Maybe there should be better mechanisms um, to reduce that cost. Maybe providing in, um, financial incentives in terms of support for these applications to improve their energy efficiency from the sponsor um, would be important. Um, and then finally consider the total cost. Uh, all too often we look at optimizing individual applications, um, but you really should be looking at um, the total workflow, uh, particularly because of the energy costs and the time costs of moving data around. So for example, if you look at the full cost of doing certain kinds of analyses, it can in fact be both faster and cheaper to do an in situ analysis, even if it is less efficient in the narrow single application view, simply because the prerequisites and the postrequisites are cheaper, that is the movement of data. And with that, I will turn it over to Sook. Hi, I'm so Shi from Tokyo Technology and other places. Um, and um, firstly, I'd like to say that um, you know, Japanese centers do charge people, most of the centers do charge people cost, and what's the cost that's calculated on? Electricity. So we've been doing that for 40 years, by the way. So um, I think it's failure of the U.S. policy to provide things free because then it gets, people get sloppy when things are free. Okay, but that's not the point. Um, so um, because I had to kind of win the slides in the last minute, I'm really sorry. A lot of my conclusions are, uh, in, uh, I have to give you verbally. Uh, because but the slide tells slides tell the story, but I'll give you the conclusion first, and then you can kind of try to follow the story in the slides. Uh, so the conclusion, so the conclusion is, power, most of the power energy efficiency. Well, you got to distinguish between energy and power. These are very different things. Energy is cost of or or the accumulation of you know the basic accumulation of power, and thus well. Uh, what we're trying to minimize is cost and you know, associated carbon dioxide emissions and so forth. And, um, but the most effective way of decreasing that is through hardware. And, and also decreasing that with uh, secondary, secondarily um, through facilities and the way we operate the facilities. And of course, uh, and the way we operate the facilities, there are a lot of controls that are embedded in the software that control the facilities. Um, so the question of, the earlier question that was asked that said, well, is the point of diminishing returns 1.0, like, no, below 1.1, you know, pursuing these PUE numbers, is it worth the cost? Well, well, of course, not likely because the diminishing returns, but that teaches us a very important lesson because, and when you make that statement, you're worrying about cost. 
So we're worrying about TCL, total cost, cost of ownership. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Sorry. So the PUE 1.1 below the Michigan returns argument, really, you're really discussing cost. And when discussing cost, that means you're worrying about return on investment. Or, or if you don't exploit the opportunity, you're losing opportunistic, opportunistic cost. So you really got to think about the holistic cost of the entire system. I mean, we're, you know, I've been doing green research for 10 years. And of course, I know a lot of techniques. We invented a lot of techniques. And those are good as basic research. But now, today, I'm wearing the hat of a, you know, a person who, who builds these big machines and who operates these machines. I do that, too. So in terms of when it gets down to real business, then it's the cost that's important. So in that sense, um, there are a lot of recent work in green computing uh, that basically tries to over-provision hardware to reduce and then tries to do uh, various optimizations, dynamic optimizations, software level in order to uh, decrease energy, which is great. However, when you get down to the cost metrics, that's a lot of waste of opportunistic cost of the hardware. And that's kind of the loose to what Bill earlier said. Because you're losing lots of money in the opportunistic cost because you're slowing your application down. And that cost may be much greater than the energy you save. And oftentimes it is. So, um, so it's really it's the final statement is that the, the, this is not a trivial problem because it depends on what metric you're trying to optimize, and these metrics are multiple. So it's really, depending on your business model, it's really a multivariate optimization problem. So returning to my computer science hat, you should really be doing this with, in a computer science way, is to apply optimization theories, or in some, time, in some cases, artificial intelligence techniques, to optimize your system to your liking, and not but don't believe in a single thing that will allow you to save energy. But then, on the other hand, you're losing opportunistic cost. Okay, so that's the whole, that's the conclusion, but I'll tell you a story very quickly. So in 11th, uh, uh, March of 2011, no, it's 3-11, out of 9-11 here. We had a catastrophic earthquake, as people may know. So then what happened was, you know, that caused lots of rolling, uh, rolling blackouts, and you know, Japan was basically in a crisis. You know, nuclear reactor blew up, not nuclear explosion, but you know, hydrogen explosion, but basically it compromised the country's electricity. And of course, supercomputing facilities, universities, itself, of course, but was told to do enormous power and energy savings, both power and energy. So um, basically, especially most of the demands are in the daytime, so uh, they, we were told to cut really, really, really bring down the, the power of the machine. So, you no. Know, that uh, basically amounted to almost you know, having a capacity decrease to like one third. So I said, well, that's not acceptable because we're losing lots of opportunities and costs. We've got you know, to have people do their science. So we did a lot of tactics. Um, one thing we did was to basically um, go into a power cap just like you know, clouds. It was a little challenging, but you know, we, uh, we devised automated ways to decrease the number of nodes that were in operation during the peak hours of the day. To, to achieve this power cap. And then uh, during nighttime, we would loop the nodes and uh, it would come back online. Of course, it's not very trivial. You know, most basket systems were, uh, uh, at those times were not designed to accommodate you know, ever-changing number of nodes so, you know, because they are, they're, they're not very aware of these massive numbers going down and going up. So we had to really... Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of tact operational tactics and software we had to write in order to achieve this. Okay, but you know, that was good, and um, we achieved that, and that's a power monitoring. So you see that you know uh, there, you see this zigzag. That's a red line, the number of nodes, and also this uh, on the graph on the bottom. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the graph on the bottom is the power. Uh, you see again this zigzag. Uh, when you go low, that's daytime, and when it goes high, it's nighttime. And during weekends, you know, we're allowed to uh, turn the machine at full speed, so you know, it's flat. Um, however, so uh, it was great news. We did achieve that. And also, our electricity bill went, went, went down significantly because our energy consumption went down because the number of nodes were lower. 
But then that's not good because we were losing opportunity. You know, the opportunistic, uh, opportunistic cost of being lost. So, and uh, we upgraded our machine to uh, new GPUs, which made it more power efficient, but also we started doing more uh, intelligent power uh, control in, back in 2014, where we established a uh, soft power cap, not hard power cap, because it was very difficult to meet exactly the power uh, the power cap, you know, so sometimes it may go minutely over, but the control will kick in to basically reduce the number of nodes as the batch queue system got back to nodes. If, they're, if, we're, uh, if we're over the power cap, they will decommission the node for a while because we can now turn on, turn the nodes on off arbitrarily. So that resulted in the graph. So the, the top one is the um, uh, before control and the bottom one is after control. You see that the curve is much more flat. And thus, and the yellow band is where we're supposed to meet the power cap, but you know, that's largely flat. Sometimes we go under, but we will not go over. So, and that was done through operational software. So software is important, uh, operation is important. Then with the, you know, of course, we did lots of other things to try to save energy. Um, um, for example, uh, we were seeing some increase in the power consumption, and we were also finding in some seasons, you know, that, um, because Japanese institutions operate in a very strict calendar year, when new people come in, you know, the machine utilization is low uh, for you know, a month or two. And sometimes, you know, for various reasons, uh, machine utilization dips to, you know, like from like 90% to sometimes like 70, 60, 70%. Um, uh, so what we did was to detect these idle opportunities and turn the nodes off. And uh, so we, and when, uh, but of course it was a very delicate balance because in order to reboot the node, uh, that would be a 10 minute worth of opportunity cost lost. So we did lots of uh, estimates and then we came up with the right algorithm to you know, turn the nodes, the idle nodes off and you know, commission them back on when that's needed. Also did other things, for example, um, if you know, it's, not, it's in fine print so you don't notice, but some of the, uh, we actually are over, actually are consolidating the nodes on some of these nodes in the queue. So uh, if you look at the nodes, the number of nodes very carefully, it's more, much more than the physical nodes. And by consolidating, we save our energy, okay? Because you know, we have lower number of nodes, and if you do the math, um, basically you get less energy uh, for the same workload because you know, more efficient. You also increase the water temperature, you know, we did all kinds of things, both in, you know, in facilities operations in order to save energy. And then when we got the new Subami 3, um, uh, we also uh, extended that to do power capping and also provisioning and kind of look for the optimal point in order to, and, um, and, but prioritizing Subami 3 operation because it's a much more efficient machine. And uh, you know, Subami 3 turned out to be a much more efficient machine, so we kind of, so we went and uh, really saved energy further. But, you know, again, uh, as I said initially, much of the efficiency comes initially from the machine itself, and then comes from the facility itself, how the machine is, how the cooling design, and then how we operate the facility, and that's the software, software piece. So, so if you look at Subami 3, now it's fully liquid cooled, it has uh, lots of uh, very high, has high GPUs. Um, everything about the machine is super efficient, um, both in terms of the power uh, of the computing, but also in terms of cooling. So uh, on the computing part, we won the Green 500. We were number, uh, we're very happy to become number one in the world. Uh, the last June, uh, June edition, at four, like 14 gigaflops a watt. But we did. Uh, the, um, we were very happy because we didn't just do this on a stunt machine, but we did it on a real production machine. That's like a 10 pedal, 12 pedal flop machine. So um, you know, but we did a lot of work in the facilities and so forth. And there's a very cool video. I won't go and play the whole thing in the interest of time. But we got very efficient uh, water cooling loops, and there were lots of innovations there to make the machine super efficient in terms of cooling. Okay, if you're interested, you can watch this model video, this uh, highlight we made. So the PUE of this machine, calculated PUE of this machine is 1.03. Uh, it's, it's still not known what the real number will be operationally, but uh, our estimate, including storage, because storage, storage unfortunately had to be cooled with uh, uh, chill water, um, 
uh, the facility, so the whole facility will become like 1.1. Well, for the machine itself, it's hot water cooled at 33 degrees Celsius. We use ambient cooling power, and with the, the estimates and simulation, and it, and it comes out to be about 1.03. So, like, uh, like, so the, the question asked: There's zero, almost zero incentive to uh, improve it further because it's diminishing returns. So, with it all this, so we have a machine that's super efficient. For some of the AI workloads, uh, we are assuming. Uh, so this is not HPC workload. Of course, the machine will run HPC workloads, but the AI workloads compared to staffing your data center uh, with a Xeon server. And by the way, these are right. These are sample numbers, not something we took out of the you know, grabbed out of the sky. Um, now, if you do machine learning, the machine is uh, on a per rack basis about 500 times faster because we use low precision, uses GPUs. There's this very dense. Um, very, very dense packaging. We use ultra fast interconnect, ultra fast IO, and everything. It'll be several hundred times faster. So, and thus the power efficiency will be a few hundred times better. Um, however, like I said, um, if we, <coughs> if we, given all this efficiency, how much can we gain by software below the facility level, at the application level? Very, very small. And moreover, a lot of these techniques sacrifice, a lot of these techniques sacrifice performance. And thus, you're losing opportunity costs. As a user, you're losing opportunity costs. As a facility, because your application runs longer, it occupies the machine more. So you can't let the other users run. So you're losing opportunity costs. So now, jury's out as to what you think, you know, if you're really optimizing for ultimate CO2 emission, of course, you should do that. If you're advancing science at maximum rate, you should do that. So the parameters to optimize differs depending on your objectives. And it's a very complicated piece. So there's just no way to say, you know, this is good or this is bad. You know, the only two things you can do from an application, from the programmer to, from the user standpoint, to give the users, all we can do to architects and operators is to build machines that will incentivize lower energy. For example, use have algorithms uh, now on modern machines being memory, you know, use, utilizing memory bandwidth is lower energy. So if you have the same time solution, memory-based algorithms are better than compute-based algorithms. Okay, so that was introduced in last year's uh, Gordon Bell Award by the Chinese. So by the way, I think you know, as much as we have done won the Green 500 several times, I think you know, Limpac is a you know, Green 500 current metric is exactly the wrong metric because it incentivizes compute. And usually today's modern architecture incentivizes compute is the wrong metric for power for energy efficiency. You should incentivize memory. The second thing is for the facility perspective is to do you know, multivariate optimization depending on what you want to achieve. But it's complex, so what do you do? So the only thing I can think of is to automate this using some sort of some sort of machine learning, and that's what we're doing. That's trying to do right now, because ultimately, again, it's a complex piece, and there are no simple answers. But we have the technologies to harness that, and we do that for applications. We should do it for ourselves. Thanks. All right, um, so I should have put pretty pictures of our building in here. I guess I didn't, uh, but uh, uh, I, I should at least introduce so NERSC. Uh, we handle the workload for the Department of Energy, the unclassified stuff, the Office of Science. So we have very diverse workloads, 6,000 users, you know, 700 different applications or so. Uh, and so it actually reminds me a lot of working at NCSA, frankly. Uh, so. Um, uh, so, you know, measurement metrics, you know, Lord Kelvin, 1883, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And, you know, I remember when uh, the beginning of the EHPC working group, you know, Dale Sarter and folks were going around measuring data centers, uh, and we never bothered to, to do that before, and they had PUEs that were like, 
on the order of two or three, meaning you're spending three times more cooling your building than you were putting energy into your systems. And b because nobody had even bothered to measure it, nobody knew to improve it. But, but now, you know, uh, we're, we've got, you know, measure we do now. So uh, we have, similar to CSCS, a very high data rate collection system. We pull in uh, data from all of our PDUs, uh, UPSs, uh, from the Cray, uh, the, the, the Cray performance management system, uh, in weather stations even uh, around. And we aggregate it together with RabbitMQ, and we push it into an elastic uh, uh, database where you can then pose queries against that data database to extract uh, the data that you want to uh, look at to answer important questions about power. So we went from, you know, 15 years ago when uh, Dale Sarter came in and said, what's your PUE? And we had no idea even how to measure it. And it, in fact, took a while to install the necessary equipment to do so, to now collecting 20,000 data items per second of every possible, you know, way of slicing up the, uh, the, the power information in our center. Um, so, you know, we went from a building that wasn't, turned out it wasn't too bad, we were a PUE of 1.3 or so, but uh, this new building that they designed and we just moved into last year uh, works on entirely outside air cooling. For the uh, liquid cooling, it's tower water without chillers, and we also, if you come up to Berkeley Lab, you'll see these giant louvers in the front of the building, and that actually pulls in outside air for, uh, we have a subset of equipment that's air-cooled. So it's very efficient, 1.1, and yet with these measurement systems, there's still room for improvement, which is pretty amazing. So here's an example here where uh, they're monitoring the power consumed by the uh, pumps, uh, by the uh, fans for the towers and, uh, and also the internal uh, uh, gear for our, our centers. And you can see that there's this huge leap in, whoops, let's see here, how do I make this thing work? Yeah, there's a huge, is it a touch screen? Oh, I can do that, all right, there you go. Uh, yeah, so a huge leap in power here. Uh, uh, and with a set point of just, you know, 51 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for the tower water. Uh, and what they traced it down to was that the, uh, we were operating the pumps slow and it forced the uh, fans for the towers to, uh, to spin up early and, and that in fact consumed a lot of uh, energy. So given that the, uh, the, the liquid cooling infrastructure, uh, the pumps actually don't consume proportionally a lot of power. When they actually brought up the uh, pump energy and had it pumping and circulating the water faster, then the fan power goes way down. Turns out, as you can hear here, moving air around is really inefficient and loud, and uh, uh, it's much better to operate your pump systems faster. And so, not only did that enable us to operate, uh, you know, reduce our energy consumption by 700,000 uh, kilowatt hours per year, uh, which is amazing. We're already at PUE 1.1, and we still found a new way to save. Uh, it also allowed us to operate our center uh, on the hottest days. We've started to see 90 degree days, and it used to be we'd have to shut down our center. Now we actually are able to ride through 90 degree days. Uh, so, uh, so huge efficiency benefit. It didn't get reflected in our PUE because all our monitoring systems can see inside of the, the fans in the pump power inside of the system in the PUE. Uh, it counts that as the uh, power of the system, and then you have the power of the facility divided by the power of the system. So we actually reduced the overall energy consumption of the center, even though it didn't affect the PUE because the, the, uh, the fans inside of the computer don't count against us. So. Anyways, uh, the other thing with pervasive analytics is that uh, you can look at other things like resource uh, utilization. This is looking at uh, gene pool, which is a, a system that we operate for the uh, genomics uh, researchers. They say, told us that they need tons and tons of memory per node, so it's got a terabyte of memory in each node. And uh, the, the lesson learned here, if you look at the bottom of this, that's an exponential scale there at the bottom. This is the cumulative distribution function of the amount of memory the users actually used when on the system. So on average, we're at the 50% point when they're only using about uh, 20 or 15% of the memory. So on average, only 15% of the memory is used and the DIMMs actually consume more power than the CPU in this particular system. Uh, moreover, those puppies are 400 bucks a pop now thanks to you know, Micron shutting down its fab. So this is cost, this is power. Uh, lesson learned, don't listen to your users without critically examining uh, the uh, data. Uh, so um, 
Now, you know, so, so uh, you know, one of the things that uh, 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 Dan brought up too is what can we do in terms of real-time control and optimization, maybe runtime systems, and, you know, I remember there's this guy we used to work with at Illinois who, you know, had this idea of sensors and actuators that were built into your code. Oh, wait, that was you. Yeah, oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and, and it was really interesting to, uh, to experiment with that. We had a code called Cactus that we were working on, and we incorporated a lot of that. Curious lessons learned from that, though, was that uh, a priori, there's actually very few degrees of freedom that are automatically there and built into your code. If you're just looking at like MPI and the, the, the little run, kind of very thin veneer runtime systems that we have these days, there, there isn't a lot of sensors and actuators. So we actually had to uh, build into our code. We had to re-architect the code to incorporate uh, the degrees of freedom that we could actually respond to sensor information. Uh, and, and then after we kind of drifted on, I think we've relapsed into not having those sensors and actuators kind of fell out of our code. So, so what you see here is this is from um, uh, Brian Austin at uh, NERSC, and it was an experiment with, uh, now we're back to we can control the clock frequency. But, and, and so you do get a bathtub curve here where there is an optimal clock frequency, but it, it's kind of disappointing how much you actually get out of it with real code. So now we're, we're dealing with you know, taking the sensor and trying to optimally control to find for a number of codes what the optimal set point is for CPU frequency. And you do get something, but it's not a whole lot. Uh, and, and I think if we're to actually get some, some automated control loop feedback, my recollection of the sensors and actuators back when we were doing it before was it requires deep thought about how to architect your code. And there isn't any magic where you could instrument MPI and there, there's just not enough degrees of freedom uh, baked into codes to, to do much with. So you really have to deep re-engineer your code for that. But that being said, We've been talking about all sorts of automated things to do because as everybody said, there's very little incentive for our users to, uh, uh, to, to uh, worry about the energy consumption of our data centers. Uh, uh, we, yes, we, we got uh, great glowing feedback at uh, NERSC. Uh, they said, we love NERSC because it's free. Um, you know, tell that to Sudeep, you know. <laughs> these, uh, it's it's an 80 million a year budget or whatnot, but... Um, uh, but, you know, anatomy of a value metric, it's good stuff over bad stuff. And so we've been talking about optimizing the bad stuff part, which is the watts. You know, we're trying to improve our operational efficiency uh, 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 so that, that, that we can mine it for uh, power. But of course, you know, flops and watts are a little bit bogus. Um, uh, we're really talking about measured performance over a measured watt, but, you know, we might have mined this measured watt thing to, to a limit case here. We're still got to be vigilant, of course. We did find another 700,000 kilowatt hours despite having a PUE of 1.1, but it just seems like the, the big territory moving forward is that optimizing that performance metric in the top. And the hardest thing about optimizing performance metrics is knowing that there's actually anything to improve there. Uh, flops are a terrible metric. Everybody talks about sustained to peak flops, but that's not the only thing you got in your system. And, and, you know, how do you know you're underperforming? How, and how bad is it? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, Houston, is there a problem? And so, you know, roofline model is a way to uh, assess uh, what, 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 I sh what my expectations should be for the performance of my code. And so, you know, here you've got a particular arithmetic uh, intensity for your code, and, and then you have a, a floating point uh, performance creates a roof line up here, depending on whether you're using, not using your vectors or using your vectors, you can have a higher, you know, peak flop rate is reasonable. Uh, and then you've got another uh, roof line here, which is the one at an angle, which is your uh, uh, memory uh, roof line. Um, and, and, and the fact is that, you know, maybe your flops are low, but you should expect it because you're hitting the memory roof line and not the flops roof line. But in most cases, we find that the codes hit neither. And that tells you, oh, there is actually room for improvement, and here's how much I could improve. But it's, it's very difficult, a priori, looking at performance counters to even know that there's a problem at all and, that there, and how much work you should put in to optimize before you should stop, because there isn't anything more to be had. 
Uh, I, of course, I also believe what Bill Grop said, which is reformulating the algorithms. This is very mechanical. It's the loops and loop blocking, but actually rethinking the algorithms is also a piece of it. It's just not something that um, HPC centers tend to do. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so we've got, you know, in collaboration with the Intel, we've got the Roofline Toolkit. Now they can use the performance counters and stuff uh, that, that they have in VTune to automate this roof lining process. And so now for each and every single kernel and loop in your code, you can figure out how close you are to the roof line and look for opportunities to optimize. And, and certainly uh, when we first got our uh, uh, X, 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 whatever system, Knight's Landing System, uh, uh, the, uh, the first thing that happened is it's, this is our first you know, foray into many core and energy efficient computing systems. And you know, we, the users were just scared senseless of it. So we said, you know what? We're going to uh, reinvest some of our money and, and Oscar's money into having uh, 20 application teams that we would really focus on and, and study their code using this Roofline Toolkit and analyze and optimize the code. And uh, we got, like, on average, the average was a three times boost in performance. And so the, when we go from low performing code to high performing codes, uh, it does consume a little bit more power, but it's like in the order of 10% when, when you actually really have all pieces of the chip humming. But a 7x improvement performance, that's a 7x improvement in energy efficiency if you pump up the performance. And so we got the biggest bang for the buck. The amount of money that we put into analyzing those codes and, uh, and optimizing them more than paid off the reduction in power and the increased throughput that we were able to offer to the users. So that was huge. Uh, it's a shame that we don't do this as a continuous operating basis, but maybe we should. Uh, uh, and, and then the last thing is going back to sensors and actuators a little bit again is that um, with all that performance data that we're able to mine out of our data centers and also uh, Microsoft Research uh, has got really a lot of instrumentation in their data centers and so does Facebook. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to really examine that data and rethink uh, architectures to give new degrees of freedom so that sensors and actuators actually would have a bigger lever to uh, fix you know fix the power issues right now with interconnects and with memory bandwidth the pins on the chip you got a fixed number that go to the memory a fixed number that go to the interconnect uh, so on and so forth uh, with photonic technologies this is a project led by Karen Bergman at uh, Columbia with photonics we could actually reassign pins depending on the needs of the workload. So using this workload data, we we're able to demonstrate that there's actually a huge amount of uh, performance benefit to be mined. So not energy benefit. By the way, we always talk about picojoules per bit for photonics, and it's only be not better than wires. Well, of course not. It's got a laser. It's not going to be better than a wire. Photonics is not more energy efficient than wires, but it has very interesting architectural attributes, which is switches that consume almost zero energy to switch light to a different source. So I can reassign all the pins dynamically to meet the needs of the workload, and I get my energy efficiency based on the architectural capabilities of photonics. So it gives us a huge degree of freedom that's missing right now because I got fixed bandwidth between memory and between interconnects. I can actually reassign bandwidth, and we're working with Cisco and NVIDIA. It's a fun RPE. Uh, enlightened uh, project. Uh, so this could give something, the Power API, something to do. So conclusions, you know, measuring, uh, you know, uh, measuring data center operational efficiency has given us huge improvements. We went from PUEs of three and two now down to 1.1. Uh, we got to stay vigilant, but there's not a whole lot more to be mined there. Uh, runtime system optimizations by driven by real-time feedback may work. But our current programming structures, our default way of engineering our codes, don't give you the degrees of freedom to do it. So we would really need to engineer our codes to get something out of the runtime, and we don't right now. Uh, and also, it is always the case that the runtime system knows less about the nature of the application than the person who wrote it. So ultimately, we need to get our tuning our codes, and we need to get the code teams, the people who run the codes, more involved. Uh, we dumped postdocs on our code teams in order to incentivize them and turns out you know everybody's willing to take a postdoc or two so that 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 was a good incentive and ultimately it paid off for us as a facility 
Um, but you know, integrated uh, analytics at every level is essential for identifying performance efficiency opportunities. Uh, that's where uh, nothing measured, nothing learned. Uh, uh, having that measurement gives you insights to tell you where you should direct your effort. Uh, and perhaps there's a, we're, we're actually collecting now more information than we can pose questions against at this point. So uh, uh, maybe it's an opportunity for machine learning to do anomaly detection or something, but we're ingesting information at a rate, I, I can't even make up questions fast enough to, to, to pose it against the database, so. All right, that's it. All right, well now it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. And as you've all noticed, this is a somewhat noisy room with an energy efficient fan. So uh, these are the, uh, a reprise of the questions I posed at the outset. So um, uh, please speak closely into the microphone and we'll start with you. Thank you very much for the uh, discussion and panel. So I would like to ask this question. So uh, it seems like the, there is a lot of effort done by the Leadership Computing Center in refactorizing softwares, like for Cosmos or uh, with NISAP. Can you share with us the uh, uh, number of FTEs or the percentage of uh, cost compared to the acquisition of the machines to have uh, success, uh, to get this uh, successful uh, achievement? Thank you. So, uh, so, so I will start with Pizdind uh, because that's a more general, that's the flagship system because if I use Cosmo, it's a special uh, mission-oriented operational uh, system. So on, for Pizdind, uh, we had, uh, and before, uh, before the first uh, uh, GPU-based system came around 2013, three years before that, we had a program called HP2C where around 10 groups were funded, and not all of them had equal success. So in terms of the, the investment uh, cost versus uh, uh, the part of that program, um, I, I think the, to me this is, I mean, we can always make uh, this percentages, but what I'm trying to say that program it started in 2010, but it is still continuing in different form and formations because it's, that's, that's kind of a parallel process that has to go on. But if I were to roughly guess how much would be the part of that uh, program uh, is, I think it's probably going to be between 10 to 20%. I, I think Cosmo is going to be a, not a correct indicator because it's a special 24-7 operational uh, uh, model situation, but the message here is investment into teams and codes, they not only pay off on our machine, they pay off on ev each and every resource that code, that group, and that team has access to. So to me, the question is a good one, but I think it's, a, it's, 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 it's kind of a, not a correct way to, to assess uh, uh, that it's, it's part of the investment and operation cost of the system. Yeah, I, I think it's very challenging to actually cost that out. Uh, for, for us, um, we actually thought about doing this earlier and didn't because uh, you know, we said, oh my god, we got 600 codes and 6,000 users. How is this ever going to be scalable? Uh, turned out that with workload analysis, only 20 of the codes accounted for three quarters of the cycles, though. Yeah. So that gave us a good uh, 20 you know, teams to engage with that so made it more tractable. Um, now, we uh, got Oscar to pony up money for about 10 to 20 postdocs or so, I think it was. And now to say that a postdoc is going to, you know, just revolutionize everybody's code, now that's, that's unrealistic and it's not, even, it's not the least bit true. But what does happen is that when you embedded a postdoc in the team that was also 50% working with the consulting group, uh, that they, they get infused with the knowledge from the, uh, uh, the consultants. I, I at NCSA, I used to be, you know, 25% in the consulting group. It was very enlightening and helped me with working with Mike Norman and Ed Seidel's code. So I thought it was a really good thing, experience. So 
then suddenly these people feel obligated to show up at meetings to learn about energy efficiency and code tuning. And so even though the, the postdocs would, did some great stuff, uh, it was actually they drew the team into the facility to learn more and be more introspective about their codes. And then the entire team got engaged in it. Uh, uh, but, but that was a really good incentivization uh, process. Satoshi, did you want to say something? Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, so Japan has a nationwide basis, so the K-computer is the, is the leadership class machine, and they're like, you know, 12, 15 uh, tier, uh, tier no, that's a tier zero machine, that there are 12, 15 um, tier one machine, Samama is one of them. And um, most of the um, co-tuning uh, resources, uh, per, uh, human resources are focused at the K-computer center and the uh, number of FTEs are about uh, 35 to 40 people um, whose job is to tune codes. Now of course most of the code tuning happens on a gate computer but of course you know a lot of these tune codes you know when they recompile to run say on a Xeon or when they're we do some other work to um, uh, port it over to GPUs and such then we'll run on Samami and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, so that's code tuning only. But um, other projects, um, such as the science projects, uh, application projects also, unlike um, many projects, they're not just targeted as to do science, but of course, oftentimes, the, um, the, uh, the, the metric of success is also to achieve scalability and also time solution. So a lot of um, postdoc code tuning happens in those projects too, um, including the the strategic, uh, nine strategic uh, 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 application area, uh, which is about 30 million per year or something like that. Um, so, uh, and also there are lots of other research. So it's, it's hard to quantify, um, but there are lots, uh, it's very hard to quantify exactly how much money is spent on tuning codes on these leadership machines. But um, uh, no, it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot of money. Uh, I would say it's in the at least tens of millions, if, if not hundred. So um, one way to increase uh, energy efficiency, if you cannot get the PoE down, is to do more per node. Um, so do you move? You see yourself moving to a design where you're actually sharing nodes, especially as nodes are getting fatter oh, yeah. between multiple applications at the same time. Yes. How will that be handled? And how do we represent sort of the different qualities and how are you going to charge differently sort of for those sort of things? Well, we all, well, Tsubama already does that. Um, because our nodes are fat nodes. And from the days of Tsubama 2, we'll always, um, in order to increase the utilization, and since these are heterogeneous machines, uh, the, the uh, heterogeneity in the use of resources as such will also become uh, quite prevalent. And thus the utilization goes lower. So we have always um, had some nodes, not all the nodes, but some nodes that would co-locate. Um, and then the, the, with the Tsubame 3, we're taking a step further to uh, use uh, containerized isolation to co-locate uh, nodes and resources with different sizes of nodes. The question of um, uh, interference um, uh, in order to get performance guaranteed, well, for one thing, of course, we try to minimize, minimize that as much as possible using, you know, using driver bypass and you know, all those techniques. Uh, ultimately, um, but you know, ultimately um, uh, performance guarantees, uh, in some cases when they're hard, when it's absolutely needed to, but it's just, um, to this level, that's a user requirement. So in those cases, because user needs more, they, we charge people higher if they dominate the resources. If they share, they get, you know, they're charged less. But this is just like a cloud bomb, you know, you pay what you get for. It. SLA. So, uh, this is a very good question. And, you, and yeah. <laughs> we, we do on time have some nodes where we do node sharing, but in the current setup, we cannot distinguish it because all the counters and measurements uh, at the, like the lowest granularity is the node level. So, uh, how we do it uh, in, in that uh, environment, uh, at, uh, I think we may really probably have to look at some of the newer APIs and solutions that are coming out and maybe try to 
integrate uh, them because I don't. I, I would imagine we are not the only, uh, how to say, business or data center with these types of things. There are other, much more business sensitive people who are offering now these cloud or whatnot services. So we haven't looked into it, but uh, I'm happy you ask uh, this question. So at the moment we can do it. I, I think for us, it's the users do have an expectation when they set up their jobs of a particular turnaround time, and so we haven't brought the job mixing down to a science enough that we wouldn't end up really messing messing with their plans. Uh, you know, they, they when they submit a batch script, it has a time, wall clock timeout in it, and and if you can't guarantee. Uh, that things would behave in a fairly consistent manner, then it really mucks them up bad. Uh, so we, on one hand, there's been experiments that have demonstrated that for overall throughput it could be a benefit, but it's the uncertainty uh, in our inability in the hardware to actually do service service level guarantees, you know, to, to uh, bound the amount of interference that the stacked jobs do on each other that, that causes us not That's to deploy it as a production feature yet. That's a conservative job. Try it. People like it. Yeah. That's our we, experience. We, people, we, we, some people who don't have high SLAs, yeah. they, you know, they get yes. lower allocation so, charge. So, they love it. So, so we do have a queue that people can submit to, which is uh, kind of the um, uh, the hoi polloi queue or something. I don't know. Uh, and so where we do we do allow the users to self-select that if you want to be charged less, you can go into the mixed queue, but. Uh, but right now it's kind of a backfill feature for our machines to keep our utilization up. Hi. Uh, this panel was, uh, was uh, for energy efficiency of uh, software. We spoke a lot about data center efficiency. You did and you are doing a great job on that. But uh, from the user's per perspective, um, one thing uh, that you need to provide to people is to have a, a good uh, orchestration with a pool of machines that are physically and uh, with the things you spoke about that is very important for your part and after it's finished for you the, the, the way this panel should talk and it's about uh, pure software efficiency and the law of physics it's it's picojoule and it's matter it's distance so avoid guys to 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 uh, penalize for example the uh, the uh, communicative the, the, the all the communication try to to, you wanted to, to fix some uh, incentive for this type of stuff. So you, it's easy to do incentive. You, the only th thing is to go faster. If you go faster, it's completely linked, completely linked with, with energy efficiency. That's all. That's finished. The debate is, is, is finished. This panel should stay two minutes. It's finished. It's, because yes, if you are in L1, it is, is uh, 10 less than L2, etc. L3, etc. So diminish. The guy have a lot of uh, arrays. Avoid, avoid doing MPI inside the node, etc. Uh, for footprint, for speed, for whatever. So if you go faster, you let go less energy. That's finish. That's all. <laughs> it helps guys to, to understand how to program, perhaps giving rules. Or, or, or uh, for example, uh, you wanted uh, to, to, to pay guys for for. Uh, Less, less memory, uh, faster, uh, faster design, uh, some, some rules, programming rules to, to promote to your customers to say, okay, if you program this way, I, I give you 10% less in your, in, your, in your bill or whatever. I, I disagree. I disagree. Uh, well, I agree to some further extent, and I think this, this statement you made, John, that as well. Uh, this core tuning code is always good. It's, ne it's never bad. Never. It's never bad. Um, that's given. Yeah. But however, however, um, maybe some. Yeah, I made the statement, but I will repeat it. Some. So suppose you have, even if you have the same time to solution, solutions, if you think of it at the algorithms level, some algorithms have much less energy footprint than the others, due to the nature of the machine of the hardware we build the hardware. So right now the hardware is such that. Uh, flow, double precision floating point units are amazingly power hungry and memory, uh, as much as moving data is expensive, but still uh, moving data around using, say, implicit solvers is much more uh, energy efficient because you're not using your double precision floating point units. So when you have same time solution, even when you have same time solution using, say, implicit solver, if you, you, know, if you can, instead of using explicit, methods, 
is much more energy efficient. So, uh, and, and also you may get faster time solution like the last year's Gordon Bell, uh, which I think was, you know, yeah, there were some caveats to it, but I think overall it was an important result. So, so people should, you know, we can have, you know, it's, it's one thing to tune the code, but when you think at the algorithm level, we can have algorithms that are more, much more power efficient, and that's why I said, you know, green 500 is incentivizing the wrong metric because it's incentivizing the most expensive part of the system to be utilized. Um, but why are we getting that is because we don't, just like Bill said, we don't incentivize people to be more energy efficient, and thus simple tuning of the code is all they do, and not really think about changing the algorithm. So, so I, I kind of agree, but there, I think there's more. You don't, there's more you can do. Yeah, so, I, I think the value of um, uh, the code tuning thing was actually to get the users to self-examine, and and then uh, after a while, it isn't just you know twiddling loops. It it ends up being re-examining whether I've got the right algorithm in place. So there's just no replacement. The, there, there's nothing we're going to do as a center about uh, applied mathematics, frankly, but we can. Uh, get them to measure. It's just like we as a center improved because we measured. Yeah. Uh, this is more about us getting them to measure so that they know what to improve. <laughs> Lowry? Okay, thank you. So enjoy the discussion. And I realize when we talk about energy efficiency, it's a complex issue. But my question to you, if we look at the next five years, what would you find to be the top priority in terms of research needed in energy efficiency. All right, where would you spend your money to make it better? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so um, you know, part of that, uh, I would still spend money to make the codes faster. Um, yeah. Our experience is similar to John's, is that when you look at a code, um, it's not a 10% improvement that you often find. It, you know, it's a 2x, 3x improvement. And so that, uh, there's no substitute for that. So it, I think um, looking at how to uh, scale that, make that more effective, um, also provide the incentives for it. So there are policy issues there as well. If I really want to focus on the specifics of, um, uh, that are directly related to energy um, efficiency, uh, I think it comes back to one of the comments that uh, Satoshi just made, which is that um, uh, all operations are not equal in terms of their power consumption. And uh, uh, it, it's classic, for example, um, for any kind of parallel um, program, if it is trying to be as fast as possible, it will arrange to have its synchronization um, execution as fast as possible, whether that's MPI or shared memory and OpenMP or something. And almost always the best way to make that as fast as possible is the spin weight. In, in other words, burn the maximum amount of power. <laughs> um, and so one can look at that and look at how you can, um, at a hardware level, um, make that more efficient because the, uh, with a lot of, the, of what we have now, and this, there are some exceptions, um, that trade-off is a trade-off for less performance and less efficiency for more power. So that's where I, those are the two places I would put it. Yeah, I, I think um, we, I, I would take it from a different angle too in that um, we're just now getting to the point that our uh, granularity of instrumentation is starting to give us insight uh, as a center into potential cross-cutting issues uh, where, you know, Bill was talking about, you know, the spin weights and, and, and stuff. I think we've had a lot of anecdotal evidence from individual users, but as we instrument across the entire workload, we might actually identify which, which are the tall poles in the tent, uh, and, and that, that instrumentation should actually provide a wealth of information to uh, our funding agencies and into the CS community about where we should be focusing our effort, because right now, without looking across the entire workload, it's not very clear to me, but we're getting to the point that we can start answering those questions. Um, yeah, I would, um, well, unless the one, okay. Um, well, firstly, I think we have made uh, um, sufficient investments into our cooling facility. You know, we have, you know, Stadium Arc Modern, data center, um, the, you know, the PUE is now 1.0 something. So, 
you know, there's diminishing returns with respect to any, any additional cooling type of investments we can make. Um, I would invest in uh, hardware, which is faster, because like I said, the most energy efficient way, you know, the best way of getting energy efficiency is to, to have a faster machine. But that's not a trivial statement, because you know, just getting flops is not the most ideal way to you know, uh, run your code faster. So, uh, there are, uh, so there are various ways we need to investigate to uh, still invest into how we invest in the, the right hardware or the architectures and so forth, and of course system software included, to accelerate our workloads. And for that, I completely agree with you know, John and, and also Bill, that ex ex extensive monitoring of the, uh, of the infrastructure is important because as much as monitoring we, we do, we actually do a lot of monitoring, don't get me wrong, we get, terab we get terabytes of data and you know, we monitor every, you know, uh, constantly on the machines. But it's, it still may not be enough. A lot of the application level metrics are not well monitored, for example. And moreover, we need to share them. Uh, I think we need to invest in, them in, in the infrastructure, share them, do analytics on them. So as much as we track these data, there's really no prevalent infrastructure to share these data so that if we apply things like machine learning to it, we still need lots of training data. And they need to be trained across different centers in order to not to do overfitting. So they can be applied to you know, different uh, situations. So I think we really need to invest in the monitoring, but not just simple monitoring, the whole infrastructure. Yeah, I, I, that, that's a good point, Satoshi. Uh, and that's something Sadaf brought up was uh, we need to start thinking about how to externalize this data. We have broad access within our facility to, to mine the data, but I think it would be great if we could get the community into mining that data. Uh, and there's just more, than, more data than we can shake a stick at or pose questions against, so maybe get a broader community thing. I also wanted to say I got to put my hardware architect hat on, too, which is that uh, there is a big opportunity to have uh, more diverse and tailored accelerators for science. Uh, we might, it might not just be CPUs and GPUs. Right now we're freaking out. GPUs, it's an accelerator, oh my. Uh, uh, now imagine though in the future if we can't get performance from uh, parallelism or, uh, or from, uh, uh, from clock frequencies anymore, you know, as Moore's law tapers off, then we're going to be confronting having a software infrastructure and programming models that have to accommodate the extreme heterogeneity and acceleration because that's where the hardware is probably going to go in the future in order to mine additional energy efficiency benefit. And we're not ready for it yet. All right, we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question uh, and then we'll adjourn. So please go ahead. Yes, hello. So I agree with a lot of things you said, and we certainly need more postdocs to tune those uh, best codes out there. Uh, and one thing I think, I, like I tell my students, the most important issue is, um, while it's like real estate, location, location, and location is where is the data. And like you say, a lot of the tools and a lot of the theory and a lot of the algorithms we teach students, they don't really address that sufficiently. And what are your suggestions for where we should start to do that in a, you know, more seriously? in a better way because or, let's face it right now people think talk still about flops you know they're they're rating machines on flops and i think that's just wrong but you know shoot me for it <laughs> all right so uh we're at the end um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Yes. <laughs> Travel safely, and we'll see you I next asked year. What, which where we should start to, to do that? They didn't answer my question. Where where, where do they start? But, what is the most important tool we should use to teach the better moving on data? Most important tool. So so, right? Okay. So concept so, tool algorithm. Okay. So um, some of us have been teaching. Uh, looking at moving memory motion um, goes back to um, well before the um, sort of our 1999 Gordon Bell paper where we um, in fact relied on that to prove that we had gotten close to the achievable performance. So um, we've known this for a long time. The community needs to do a better job of not talking about flops. Uh, because the students pick up on what we talk about. So it's our fault, um, your fault, my fault. Um, we, and so we really do need to focus on that. Um, I worry about 
focusing on tools because they will tend to show you how many like loads and stores were used, that's still the wrong thing to be looking at. Yeah. Um, again, if you're looking at our, um, it was there, our SC paper in 1999, you count what the algorithm requires, not what the system, the compiler, the you know, code system uh, created out of that. And so that's what people need to be doing. Um, and the, those models are back at the envelope level of complexity. There's no excuse for people not to use them. And, and we're still t teaching numerical methods classes with order of complexity as always the numerical operations. That's j just how we teach it, and it's, it's wrong, wrong now. It's wrong. <laughs> no, no, it's not wrong it's now. Well, it's been it, wrong. It's been wrong it's for been several wrong. decades. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here to end this and say I used to tell my students in parallel computing that in all your algorithms class you learned about complexity. In parallel computing, we're all about constants. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.